Hello! In this video, we look at how a free quantum field appears to an accelerating observer. For that, however, we first need to talk about acceleration in special relativity. Fortunately, my job has been made a lot easier by Eigen Chris, who has recently made an excellent video on the subject. In fact, he's making a whole series on the subject. I urge you to watch at least the first of his videos first and then come back to this one. In this video, I will merely summarize relativistic dynamics involving accelerating frames. We will only be interested in constant acceleration. However, in relativity, the notion of constant acceleration is different from that of Newtonian mechanics, which states that the world line of a particle moving with a constant acceleration is a parabola. Clearly, this cannot be correct in relativity, as the velocity of an object following this world line would eventually exceed the speed of light. However, if we consider a constant acceleration as measured by an accelerometer in the accelerating frame, the world line would be a hyperbola, where tau is the time as measured by the observer's wristwatch, the proper time, and a is the acceleration as given by the accelerometer, called proper acceleration. Differentiating with respect to tau, we get the four velocity. Differentiating again gives us the four acceleration. Notice that the square spacetime distance of the four acceleration is a squared for all values of tau. If we pick an arbitrary value for tau, the instantaneous four velocity and four acceleration vectors look like this. If we draw straight lines through these vectors, we see that they form the instantaneous t prime and x prime coordinates of the moving observer. In other words, coordinates of a frame moving with constant speed. If this world line corresponds to, say, the back of a ship, what would the world line traced by the front of a ship look like? Assuming, for simplicity, that at rest the ship's length is 1 over a. Well, if we don't want the ship to be squashed or pulled apart from the perspective of the observers moving with the ship, we must insist that the length of the ship, from their perspective, be preserved for all values of tau. The curve we trace in this manner is also a hyperbola, where a tilde is one half a. This looks almost exactly like the first hyperbola, except that we have the same factor here as we do here, which is not the case for the second curve. Since we could have started the whole discussion with this hyperbola, there is no reason for these two factors to be different. Logically, they must have the same form. This implies two things. One, the front of the ship is accelerating half as much as the back. And two, the clock at the front of the ship is running twice as fast as the clock at the back of the ship. So. If, say, the observer at the front of the ship built a clock that runs twice as fast, the two observers would agree on the lengths in both the time and the space direction. And we can do this scaling for every clock along the ship where w is the scaling factor and t' prime is tau as measured at the back of the ship. We can define a new variable x' prime which gives us the distance to any point on the rocket from the origin. So, we now have a coordinate transform between the stationary observer and the observers on the ship. If we extend t prime to minus infinity, we get what's called the Rindler coordinate system, also known as Rindler wedge. From now on, we will call the accelerating observers Rindler observers. If we compute the square of an infinitesimal spacetime distance, we see that the metric for the Rindler observers appears to be curved. 
For convenience, we introduce a logarithmic distance chi in terms of which the square spacetime distance simplifies to this. Finally, we can ask the question, what does a quantum field look like to an accelerating observer? Since spacetime for the Rindler observer is curved, we need to know how to construct quantum fields in curved spacetimes, which is to say we need to write down a field Lagrangian that is invariant under any coordinate transform. It turns out to be rather simple. For a massive scalar field in four dimensions, the Lagrangian looks like this, where g mu nu is the inverse metric and g is the determinant of the metric. For a flat spacetime, this Lagrangian reduces to the one we've seen in the first video of this series. We can see immediately that this part is invariant. But what about this part? For expediency, I will leave this for you to prove. For the purposes of this video, I will only consider a massless scalar field in two dimensions, that is, one dimension of space and one dimension of time. We should consider such a field as only a toy model, as it does not represent reality in any way that might be deemed approximate. Much like Gauss's law in a two-dimensional space yields a logarithmic electric potential for a point charge, is not at all an approximation to the potential in three-dimensional space. However, it turns out that in this case, the results for the two-dimensional spacetime is exactly the same as that for a four-dimensional spacetime. And since the former is technically much simpler, we will go with it. If you're interested in the four-dimensional case, I put a link in the description box below that you can check out. Since we are only interested in a massless scalar field in a two-dimensional spacetime, we replace this integration factor by dx dt prime and set m to zero. For the metric in an accelerating frame, the Lagrangian becomes... Remarkably, it looks the same as a Lagrangian for flat spacetime. We put a prime on the phi's here to distinguish them from the phi's in flat spacetime. The equation of motion for phi in both frames is the Klein-Gordon equation for a massless scalar field. The solution can be written in terms of plane waves, like so, where a and b are the operator coefficients for the zero modes of the Fourier expansion. For convenience, we will consider discrete values of k. This simply means that we consider our universe to be large but finite. At the end of our calculation, we can take L to go to infinity if we want to. The normalization factor here was chosen so as to satisfy these commutation relations without any weird factors creeping up here. What would the commutation relation be for the Rindler observers? Since the field is a scalar, we can replace phi prime with phi. Then, using the chain rule for this term, we get... The second term is zero. And, recalling the coordinate transformations between the two frames, we obtain this. Expressing x and y in terms of chi, zeta, and t prime, and using this delta function relation, leads to this result. So finally, we have the commutation relation for the Rindler frame. This factor here is irrelevant.
so we can get rid of it. But this commutation relation means that these operators must satisfy the same commutation relations as these operators. So the fields are the same for both observers. Nothing to see here, I guess. See you in the next video. Just to be sure, let's dig a little deeper. First, to make life easier, let's define new variables u and v like so, and similarly for the Rindler observers. These are known as light cone coordinates. In terms of them, the fields in the two frames can be expressed like this. If we pick any point in the upper half of the Rindler wedge, we see that the distance along x will always be greater than the distance along t. Therefore, the light cone variable v will always be positive. Similarly, if we choose a random point in the lower half, we also get that v is always positive. For the variable u, the converse is true. It is negative everywhere in the Rindler wedge. Since u is always negative and v always positive, we can never get these terms and these terms to match. We can never get phi plus to be the same as phi minus. The two terms never speak to each other. Which means we can analyze them separately. What would be interesting to know is how phi minus, for example, is related to phi plus and phi minus down here. So let's explore that. We can write capital U in terms of T prime and chi, like so. If we write the explicit form of the cinch and the cosh, we see that capital U only depends on lowercase u. Similarly, we get that capital V depends on the lowercase v only. So, we find that phi plus up here communicates with phi plus down here. And same goes for these two. There is no cross communication. Okay, let's see then what the relationship is between, say, the phi pluses. If we replace u here with this expression, we see that these functions are no longer the Fourier modes. So, we can't compare these operators frequency by frequency. To get the Fourier modes back, we must express these functions as a Fourier series. For convenience, we will rename the term with negative q beta. Inserting these back in here and changing the dummy variable k to the dummy variable q, we arrive at this expression. If we follow the same logic for phi minus and phi minus prime, we end up with these expressions. Now, if phi is to equal phi prime, then these must be equal as well as these, which leaves these relations for the constant terms. So, Putting everything together, we get... In order for the first relation to hold, the Fourier coefficients must be equal. Which means that the creation and annihilation operators in the Rindler frame are linear combinations of A and A dagger. But you might be thinking, so what? Why is this interesting? To answer this, let us look at the vacuum expectation value of the number operator for the Rindler observers. 
By vacuum, I mean the lowest eigenstate of the number operator in a stationary frame, or simply, the vacuum observed by a stationary observer. If we insert the right-hand side of these expressions into here, we obtain this long expression. However, note that only these terms survive. All the other terms are zero. So the final result is this. Remarkably, the Rindler observers do not see vacuum. They see particles. Even more remarkably, if we computed this sum, we would find that it is equal to this. Converting back to the SI units, we find that the speed of light squared appears here. We could also multiply and divide by h bar and remember what the energy of a photon is. Then we can write the exponent like this, where bk is the Boltzmann constant and t is defined as this. Plugging back this redefined exponent, we find that the average number of particles detected by the Rindler observers is equivalent to the Bose-Einstein distribution for blackbody radiation at this temperature. What is a vacuum to the inertial observers appears to be a warm bath of photons to the Rindler observers. Amazing! This is called the Anru effect. In a later video, where I will discuss black hole radiation, we will see that the temperature of Hawking radiation is this, where g is the gravitational acceleration at the surface of a black hole, also known as surface gravity. From this relationship, it appears that acceleration is what causes radiation for non-inertial observers. But actually, it turns out that what really causes these radiation effects is the presence of a horizon. I have covered the horizon of black holes in two of my videos. If you want to know about the horizons created by acceleration, watch the video series by Eigen Chris I mentioned earlier. Also, if you are not yet aware of the channel PBS Spacetime, you should check it out. Their videos are much less technical than mine, but they are very good if you want to get a feel or build an intuition for a subject. In particular, I thought their video on the Anru effect and Hawking radiation were well done. So that's all I have for this video. I realize I've skipped some technical things, like proving that this sum does indeed equals to this, etc. Showing this explicitly would have made this video too long, so I decided to make a short appendix video, probably at the end of the series. Okay, see you in the next video in 2022. Just kidding, probably sooner.
Apple Speed Guitar. 